right, everybody, we're going to talk about neuromuscular disorders now. Um, I did throw in, just because I'm not sure where it exists in your curriculum, um, some cranial nerve disorders as well, just because I wanted to make sure they got touched on um, before you graduated. Uh, it's not technically in our uh, curriculum, but I wanted to put them somewhere. So... Um, before we head into discussing the actual disorders themselves, I wanted to point out a few things about the actual nerve cell. Um, mostly the myelin sheath, because that is going to be an issue um, with one of our disorders here. This myelin sheath is um, insulation, basically. It's produced by these little guys called glial cells. And it is an insulation around the nerve fiber that speeds, um, that keeps the electrical signal conducting down the axon. So um, a nerve signal starts out in the brain. Um, and when a nerve signal starts out, it starts out in the nerve and it transfers down the axon and then it um, transmits from one axon to another. It looks like a little person, doesn't it? Um, so we have one nerve signal and then it makes a little jump and then that sends it down this way and when it gets to the end to these terminals it will either jump to another nerve signal to another nerve and continue on its merry way or it will finally reach its destination and it needs to jump to its destination to make the destination do whatever it's going to do so um the, a nerve transmission that comes from the brain will pass through multiple um, nerve cells on its way to its destination. Um, so at these jump areas, nerve cells don't touch each other. They have um, synapses in between them. So let me see if I can clear. I don't think I have that on the next slide. Um, oh, well, we do have uh, the synapses there. Um, let me show you on this slide if I can blow this up a little bit. Um, this is a synapse here, and you can see how the purple nerve is barely touching the um, the purple nerve is barely touching here. And what it's going to do is it's going to jump onto this next nerve cell. So the nerve generate the nerve pulse is going down through this axon, it's going to show up here, and then it's going to jump into the receiving neuron, and then it's going to keep heading down its way until it gets to where it needs to go. Um, what they are showing here is what is happening at this site. So this circle right here is blown up over here. And what is happening is there are these neuro, there's always a little space, even though it looks like they're touching, there's a little space there. And the nerve signal actually transmits with something called neurotransmitters. Um, so if we are missing neurotransmitters, then the nerve cell can't, the nerve can't make that jump. So let's say that we have an impulse and let's just say we're missing our neurotransmitters. Then when that nerve transmission gets down here, it doesn't make it any further if you're missing a neurotransmitter. Um, if you have enough neurotransmitters, it makes the jump and then it continues down its own way. So we need these neurotransmitters to keep neural impulses or neural signals or, or energy signals going to send messages from the brain to the rest of the body. So I'm going to go back out there. Um, so what we are looking at is the myelin sheath helps that neural impulse travel down the nerve fiber um, until it gets to its ends. Um, the nerve fibers itself in the brain are only a millimeter long. They're really teeny tiny. But in our spinal cord and some of our, uh, our uh, extremities, we can have nerve fibers that are three feet long. So... They, there's plenty of opportunities that if this myelin sheath is broken, um, so let's say it's broken here, um, that nerve signal heading down this way can get weaker. It can disappear and dissipate out um, of the insulation if the insulation is not there. 
Um, so if we don't have good myelin sheaths, then the nerve transmission gets dissipated and doesn't make it all the way down to the end of the nerve. So we need the myelin sheath to keep the electrical signal inside of the nerve cell and keeps the nerve impulse conducting down to the body. So um, you can see that disorders of the myelin sheath are going to cause problems. Um, disorders of the nerves themselves are going to cause problems. Um, disorders of neurotransmitters are going to cause problems. Um, so we have a couple of different problems going on here. So um, that's what I want to talk about, the nerve cell. Um, the nerve cell itself, like I said, has, um, you don't need to know all the terminology, but I did want to point out the myelin sheath. And I do want to point out the fact that we have, we actually have a, um, a neural, you have neural um, connections and you have the neuromuscular junction. And so this is where a nerve, that's the bottom picture here, um, where the nerve ends and the muscle begins. So this is the muscle and this is the nerve. And now the electrical signal is coming down and it needs to bridge the gap so that it can tell the muscle what to do. So this is, let's say this is our, um, our finger muscle, and this is the signal from the brain to point. And this is our finger muscle, and this is the signal coming down from the brain saying, go ahead and point. Um, in order to get that point going, we need to have something cross over here to stimulate the muscle to contract. So what we need is we need this neurotransmitter named acetylcholine. Now there are other neurotransmitters called dopamine, there is norepinephrine, there is serotonin. Those are neurotransmitters that transmit from nerve to nerve. Um, acetylcholine is the only one that goes nerve to muscle. These are all nerve to nerve. Um, so that's something that we are going to see that if you are have a problem with your acetylcholine level, we have a problem with our nerve to muscle um, communication. So the neurotransmitters are our communication from electronic signal to an actual um, uh, contraction of muscle, and that is acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter involved from nerve to muscle. So at the neuromuscular junction, we have acetylcholine helping us get that nerve signal to the muscle. Um, from the little purple nerve to the little blue nerve, um, those neurotransmitters in there could be dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, um, and that is our, those will indicate it's supposed to be a contraction. So that is just a little background behind our neural system and our neuromuscular junction with acetylcholine and um, what we're going to be seeing there. So let's first look at our cranial nerve disorders. These are actual nerve disorders. Um, of certain cranial nerves, and I, like I said, I put them in here. Um, these are new to you this semester, um, just so that you have an idea of what they are. Um, each thing is just two slides long. Um, trigeminal neuralgia is the fifth cranial nerve, which is a sensory nerve. Um, it does sensation only, and what you're having is inappropriate sensations. You're having a burning sensation um, along this trigeminal nerve. It is chronic nerve pain, and it's triggered by a touch to the area. So a touch on the cheek, um, a um, wind brushing against your face, um, and it's an inappropriate nerve sensing. Um, so basically, a small, tiny movement will cause burning pain along that nerve. Um, that's, it's hard to diagnose a lot of times. Um, it doesn't have any um, clinical symptoms other than pain. Um, so it is hard to get the physical diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia. There's not anything that you can actually see on an x-ray or an exam or an MRI other than possibly increased activity of that nerve. Um, so what you're looking for is cranial nerve exam. Um, they will 
it's a what is it subjective symptom um, is pain um, with the touch to the cheek or the forehead um, and what they do to treat it is give an anticonvulsant tegretol carbazamine um, you could add other anticonvulsant medications um, and they've actually one of the more um, useful treatments for it is Botox for paralyzing that nerve now of course you don't have sensation um, if you Botox the nerve, but it does stop the trigeminal neuralgia. So anyway, that's just a quick thing on trigeminal neuralgia, fifth cranial nerve, hypersensitivity, inappropriate sensitivity to a light touch, and it creates a burning sensation for one to two minutes um, that does go away. Um, and I put mostly in here that um, carbazamine or Tegretol, which is the um, anticonvulsant, the anti-epileptic epileptic that we give for trigeminal neuralgia. Many, many, many um, medication interactions with it, um, and they're not supposed to be drought, they're not supposed to be um, driving because there's risks of blurred vision, double vision, uh, lack of coordination, dizziness, um, and alcohol will potentiate that effect. So you probably got that when you talked about seizure medications, which um, Tegretol is a seizure medication, um, and most anticonvulsants have the same Thing. So it can go along with Tegretol, but it also goes along with most of your anticonvulsants. Um, alcohol potentiates the effect, and, um, and that is trigeminal neuralgia. Bell's palsy um, is an autoimmune disease where the cranial nerve 7 becomes inflamed. So trigeminal neuralgia was cranial nerve 5. Bell's palsy, cranial nerve 7. This one's usually associated with Lyme disease as well. And this is causes a unilateral paralysis of facial muscles. Um, there's some pain, and then there's weakness and numbness until that nerve becomes inflamed. Cranial nerve 7 is involved in our um, facial symmetry and um, our facial muscle movements. And so when cranial nerve seven becomes inflamed, then our facial muscles on the inflamed side are not functioning properly. Um, so blurred vision, inability to blink on that side, difficulty chewing, speaking, change in taste. Um, the worsening cue of Bell palsy really is that you can't blink on that affected side and you have ptosis there but you can't blink so you're at very high risk for corneal damage because without our blinking we have no lubrication of our eye so cranial um, with bell palsy um, the paralysis the facial paralysis it's like being injected with novocaine at the dentist for that whole side of the face um, it is paralysis of that facial muscle so if you've ever tried to chew after the dentist you can imagine living with bell palsy is um, hard to live with if you have a whole side of your face that is not functioning properly um, it's definitely going to be hard to chew and speak without all of your muscles working appropriately. Um, if you've never been to the dentist and never had one side of your face numbed, you are a lucky human being. Um, but anyway, if you've ever had that and you can try to, when you're trying to, um, you know, drink or eat, um, things don't work quite right. Um, but the big, big worsening cue of it is, or the big concern that we have mm -hmm. is the, um, the, decreased lack, uh, decreased lubrication of our eye that could cause permanent eye damage um, to the affected eye. So what do we do for it? Um, it is an autoimmune attack on that one cranial nerve, so they might get steroids. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, again, this is an inflammation autoimmune process, so steroids and anti-inflammatories are good for our autoimmune processes. Um, antibiotics, if Lyme disease is present or the cause of it, and big, big uh, intervention, artificial tears, ophthalmic ointments when you are um, paralyzed and have ptosis or eye droop and you cannot blink that eye could be um, permanently damaged by no lubrication. So definitely ophthalmic ointments are a big intervention for Bell palsy. Most of this subsides in three to six months, but in that time you don't want to permanently damage that eye. Um, and in that time um, you definitely have a lot of eating um, and speech difficulties with that paralyzed side of the face. Um, so they will try to 
stimulate that muscle tone, maintain the muscle tone. It does not fix paralysis, but if you've ever used TENS or um, transcutaneous um, electrical stimulation where they'll put little electrodes on the skin and basically um, kind of um, stimulate the muscle to keep it contracting on a small level so that you don't end up with peril, you know, that you don't, you can't really rehab the face very well. So massage the muscles in there, keep stimulating the muscles, keep blood flow to them, that even though they're paralyzed, we want to keep them, um, fresh and, um, and, uh, I don't want to say hydrated, um, uh, Get the keep the circulation to them, keep them contracting on a small level, um, just like you would do passive range of motion on a uh, flaccid limb, just to keep the muscle tone up. We're going to do the same thing on the face. Um, they should use protective glasses or goggles, patch at night, and keep their eye as lubricated as possible so they don't end up with permanent eye damage after the Bell's palsy episode. And migraine. Um, just, I'm going to point out on migraine that there are um, a couple of phases. Um, not every migraine has every phase, but there are four standard phases to a migraine. It's more than just a headache. Um, you can have a prodrome, which is a sensation that's hours to days before the migraine. But the thing is, is it's the same every time. Maybe you smell a certain substance. Uh, maybe you hear a certain sound. Maybe you see a certain um, pattern. Um, there's something sensory that happens before every migraine. There's an aura that happens right before the migraine. Um, it could be um, blacked out vision. It could be um, halos around your vision. It's usually visual. Um, it could be a prickling sensation. There is some kind, everyone has their own. If you have a migraine, um, the prodrome and the aura are just signals that the migraine is coming. And then there is the severe incapacitating headache. That headache has photophobia, light sensitivity, phonophobia. Um, you don't like loud sounds. Um, and then sometimes even quiet whispers can make you crazy. Um, severe incapacitating headache. And then there's an actually a um, recovery phase that's almost like post-ictal. It's called post-drome. And you have weakness, cognitive difficulties, um, fatigue, um, for hours to days after the headache. So those four phases are um, characteristic of a migraine. And um, once someone knows their prodrome or their aura and their recovery, that's what their migraines feel like to them. Very personal um, sensation for migraines. Not everyone has the same auras or prodromes. And um, the worsening cues are a migraine that does not get better. Um, a migraine with uh, visual disturbances or sensory disturbances that lasts longer than 72 hours. Um, you can have a seizure triggered by migraines, and um, having frequent migraines increases your risk of having a stroke, especially combined with oral contraceptives. So that is something to be looking for for someone that does um, complain of migraines. They do have people that are admitted to the ED with the status migrainous. Um, and I've had people even come in with, um, blown pupils. Um, not because, you know, where one pupil is large and one pupil is small. And that's just because the nerves are involved in the migraine are affecting the, um, the, uh, the cranial nerves that are involved in eyesight. So, um, there are a lot of different symptoms with migraines. Um, what we do to treat them are something called tryptans. Um, they are serotonin receptor agonists. So serotonin, again, there's a lot of, um, you probably remember them from psych, all of your, um, your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, your um, dopamine agonists. You've got a lot of things that help these neurotransmitters either continue to um, work or reduce the number of neurotransmitters that are maybe overstimulating certain nerve areas. Um, so there's a lot of different, um, when you see anything involving serotonin or dopamine um, or norepinephrine or acetylcholine, they are working with our neurotransmitters. 
Um, so anyway, with migraines, um, it seems to be that the serotonin receptor agonists, these tryptans, um, work well for migraines. Um, of course, symptomatically rest in a quiet, dark environment, elevate the head of the bed that reduces um, any swelling from vasodilation that's happening, and um, cold makes the uh, migraine feel a little bit better. Um, so that's migraines. So those were just, those really aren't in our curriculum. I don't know if I would test you on these since they're not really um, in our curriculum to test. I have enough stuff to test. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to have test questions on Bell palsy or migraine or trigeminal neuralgia, but I wanted you to hear about it at some point during your nursing education since they do come up in a lot of NCLEX questions. Um, so I haven't decided whether it'll be a test question or not, but I wanted to put them out there. Um, our next section is on nerve degeneration disorders. So if I'm saying nerve degeneration, I am saying the nerve is breaking down somewhere. So degeneration means breaking down. So we're talking about the nerve conduction is breaking down somewhere. The nerve itself is actually disintegrating or degenerating. Something is missing off the nerve that is causing conduction disorders. And we have three nerve generation, degeneration disorders, and it's because um, generation means to grow, degeneration means to shrink or destroy or, um, I'm trying to think of another term, but basically degeneration means to shrink or to destroy or to, I'm, I can't think of the word that I'm thinking of there. Um, but anyway, that's what we're looking at is that the nerve is no longer functional and it is not um, pro doing um, nerve transmission well. So multiple sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease is another name for ALS, and Guillain-Barre syndrome. So we're going to look at multiple sclerosis first, and this is an autoimmune. So this has to do with our immune system. And whenever our immune system attacks something it's not supposed to, like our nerves, Come on, man. The immune system is attacking the myelin sheath. Well, remember, the myelin sheath was our, um, our insulation along here. I should probably do another color that shows up better on here. Let's do black. So this is our myelin sheath along here. And that is how... Oh, that, I'm so talented at drawing. Um... This is our myelin sheath along this nerve here, and it is helping insulate nerve conduction. But now, for some reason, the um, immune system has decided to attack myelin sheath. And so now what is happening um, with our nerve here is that now, instead of a beautiful sheath, we have a area of exposed nerve. So what is happening here is let's get our conduction down. So our conduction's going down, and now there's a hole. Well, now the conduction, kind of the electricity fizzles out, and now we just don't have, we kind of have a petered out electrical signal, and we don't really have um, good conduction of nerve transmissions. So the immune system is attacking this myelin sheath and causing it to break down, um, kind of like picking at a scar. If the, my, if the immune system keeps going in there and picking at this area of myelin sheath, it will eventually scar, and scar tissue will not conduct either. So let's... Um, let me draw and get rid of my beautiful drawings here. And let's say instead of a broken down sheath, now we have a scarred sheath. So I'm going to draw that in, a, let's see, we'll make that orange. So now we have a, a basically a area of scarring here. And that area of scarring will block nerve conduction. So this nerve is coming down. It's saying, point your finger. And then it kind of gets hung up there in the scar tissue and then never gets that message down to the finger to point its finger. So um, that's basically a very simplistic um, drawing of multiple sclerosis. That is a, the immune system has attacked the myelin sheath. When the myelin sheath is um, disintegrated, we don't have good nerve conduction, but we make myelin. Um, 
myelin is restored. There are these lovely little guys called the glial cells that are in our nerve cells that are kind of all surrounding our nerve cells, and they make myelin. And so they'll recoat the nerve. If the immune system attacks it, it'll recoat the myelin, and then nerve transmission begins again. But the immune system will attack it again, and there's constantly little holes and little pokes and little irritations that over time, and with increased number of flare-ups, you end up with huge amounts of scar tissue along the myelin sheath, or along the nerve sheath, and it ends up causing problems with conduction. So um, basically you have periods of slowed nerve transmission, and then you have periods of uh, remission. So you have exacerbations and remissions because the exacerbations are when the immune system is attacking the myelin sheath and destroying it. Then we make new myelin and you go into a remission. And so you have exacerbations, remissions, exacerbations, remissions, and um, stress, fatigue, infection, all the things that set off our immune system um, set off um, attacks on our myelin. So the cues are um, numbness and tingling, so inappropriate nerve sensation. So also nerve transmissions go from the skin up to the brain or from your fingers or from your toes up to your brain. So when you have nerve transmission being blocked, sometimes that nerve transmission that gets up to the brain is something that is felt that is wrong. So maybe I, um, I poked my, I put a needle on my fingertip. I poked my fingertip with a needle, but the brain perceives it as something else, or I'm just touching something lightly with my finger and it's taking, um, it's, it feels numb or it feels tingly. Basically, paresthesias are wrong sensations, um, and this time it's due to bad nerve transmission. Um, vision disturbances, most commonly um, patchy blindness or blurred vision or double vision. So this is the nerve transmission from the eyes to the brain are being um, disrupted. So things the brain, what you're seeing is not getting transmitted to the brain appropriately. So any vision disturbances, um, difficulty walking, difficulty with gait, um, muscle spasticity. So sometimes that nerve signal will... Um, let me draw my little nerve signal. So here we have the scarred tissue. We have this tissue. Those nerve signals like, dang it, walk, dang it, walk. And then all of a sudden it will blow through and transmit a ton. Um, and that will add some spasticity to your movement. So rather than sl um, smooth movements, um, you can have muscle spasticity or nerves generations finally arriving late or not when you want them to. Um, so you don't necessarily become paralyzed. You can have muscle spasms as well as um, flaccidity. Flaccidness means paralyzed, meaning I'm telling my leg to move, but that nerve transmission doesn't get there. Leg doesn't move, feels kind of flaccid. Then all of a sudden, all those signals arrive at once and I get a jerk of my leg. So things are not working 100% um, appropriately there, um, and these are our symptoms. Slowed or slurred, slurred, slowed or slurred speech. Um, I talk too fast, and so you probably have recognized this by now. Um, my brain is just firing hard. You know how many muscles it takes to get speech going? Our speech process involves our, um, our tongue, our throat, our facial muscles. Um, there's a lot of stuff involved in speech. And when our nerve transmission is not working quite right, um, we have trouble getting speech out. Um, so those are the cues, the early cues. So vision disturbances, difficulty with your gait, slowed, slurred speech, um, numbness, tingling, those are the signs we would see during our exacerbations, remissions. As this disease progresses, um, the nerve transmission permanently becomes slowed or gone due to the scars and plaques on the nerve, and um, that leads to bowel and bladder dysfunction. Our bowel and bladder are heavily nerve-dependent, um, do a lot of autonomic um, nerve stimulation, and um, when those get destroyed, then we end up with constipation. And again, the bladder can be the same way. You can have a flaccid bladder um, that doesn't contract at all, that doesn't respond to any signals from the brain, um, or it's not sending signals up to the brain to say it's full. So you can have a flaccid bladder. You can have a spastic bladder, 
where all of a sudden signals will get down there to the bladder, the bladder will contract and you'll have some incontinence. So um, blow and, blow, bowel and bladder dysfunction. Um, you can have weakness paralysis of extremities due to the scarring that signals are not getting down there to the extremities anymore. Difficulty swallowing because that is a complex process that requires a lot of um, innervation of many muscles. And if some of those um, transmissions do not get there, then we can't have clear speech swallowing. Um, and then this is happening not only in our neurons to our extremities, but it's happening up in our brain too. So conduction of thought, conduction of, um, you know, general brain transmissions eventually do also get scattered and scarred and having trouble finding words, short-term memory issues, mood issues, all due to the decrease in transmission around the brain due to scarring um, of these nerve cells. So we're going to be keeping an eye on our major symptoms, vision, gait, strength, um, bowel and bladder function. The medications to, we don't have a treatment. There is no cure for multiple sclerosis. Um, the drug of choice is a nerve-specific immune suppressant. Um, it's named finglimoid, finglimoid, finglimoid. Um, and there is also a, um, an IV infusion. So, um, and then there's something called interferon B, which is a whole system immune suppressant. So finglimod and natalizumab, I don't know, I can't say names. Um, those two are specific to um, preventing attacks on the immune system. So those are our two drugs of choice. Um, finglomod is oral. Um, so this one's a pill that they can take. And this one is a monthly IV infusion. So they generally will do the oral pills for a while uh, and then try the monthly IV infusion. You can see that from the little chart here that um, the IV infusion is the most effective drug. But again, having to go in for a monthly IV infusion um, when you could just take an or you know a pill every day to control your symptoms, uh, you can take the pill for they'll. It's up to the patient and the physician uh, which one they do. But we do have two meds um, for multiple sclerosis, and they are specific nerve immune suppressants. They prevent the white blood cells from um, attacking the nerves, which is exactly what we want. It slows the disease process. Um, interferon B is kind of a big gun that is randomly effective, but it's a whole system immune suppressant um, that if the other two do not work, then they might try that one. Um, and you've probably heard of gabapentin. They use it for diabetic neuropathy, um, any kind of nerve-based pain. Gabapentin is um, prescribed for any kind of um, nerve overexcitability or nerve pain or um, or paresthesias. So you will see gabapentin for many, many reasons, but it is always to treat nerve-based pain. Um, the true help is to prevent the exacerbations. The more exacerbations, the worse your outcomes is. So um, increased exacerbations. I can't spell. Exacerbations equals worse outcomes. Again, you know, when your mom says don't pick at your scab and you won't get a scar, um, if you are a habitual picker or you keep picking at something, it's going to scar over. Um, the same way with multiple sclerosis. The more you have exacerbations, the worse um, scarring you're going to have. And scarring is what causes our worsening symptoms of bowel and bladder um, paralysis. Um, so we want to reduce the number of exacerbations. So um, stress management, treating infections, um, fluids and fiber, and um, just keeping yourself healthy and free of infection uh, would be the best way to prevent and slow the process as well as medication compliance. So that was multiple sclerosis, a disease of the myelin sheath. Um, it is autoimmune. We're going to take the autoimmune uh, suppressants that are specific, um, the finglimoid and the natalix. Yes, I said that exactly right. Um, so that is multiple sclerosis. Um, hopefully we can hold off on worsening cues by reducing exacerbations and medication compliance. 
ALS, on the other hand, is not autoimmune. This is genetic. Um, this is a bad genetic card. Um, and this is um, basically where the neurons, the muscle, the um, the motor neurons in the brainstem get programmed for destruction, and they die. Um, they die inappropriately, and nerve cells don't regenerate well. So once they've been killed off, they're dead for goods. Um, so this is a genetic disorder. Um, there you do have, if you are lucky enough to have a gene for Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, um, this is a, um, there are risk factors for that gene activating and killing off it's um, in killing off the nerve cells and smoking viral infections and toxins are um, supposed risk factors for activating that gene. So it's not an immune response. It's not the white blood cells attacking the neurons. It is actually a gene saying, you're going to go now. Your time is up. Um, most cells in our body have a, a programmed lifespan and this is where a gene kind of activates and tells that motor nerve cell, "Sorry, your time is up. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna die now. It's time for you to go." And they do. Um, so what? This is their motor neurons in the brainstem and the spinal cord. And so what's happening is there's nothing wrong with the muscles. The nerve is dying. And then when the nerve never stimulates the muscle, if you never stimulate a muscle, it becomes flaccid and weak. Um, what is happening at the beginning is that, um, as that nerve cells are starting to die off sporadically, you'll have alternating periods of muscle rigidity and weakness. Have you ever seen the movie, what is it, The Theory of Everything, about, um, uh, Stephen Hawking? Um, he had ALS. Um, Lou Gehrig is the famous baseball player that had ALS, um, and got the name, um, they finally gave it a name for him. Um, but, uh, Stephen Hawking is another famous person and they wrote and they did the movie. So you have to watch a movie this week, the theory of everything. Um, but that was about him developing and working through, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. He actually had a very long progression of, um, the disease. It took many decades for the disease to get to the worsening cues. Um, anyway, alternating periods of muscle rigidity and weakness leading to, you know, trips, gates, um, you know, issues with spasticity, what it looks like. You get a lot of muscle twitches. Um, basically, the motor neurons are dying, and so as that nerve dies, it kind of sends off a little last um, jolt. Now, we have a lot of motor neurons, so it's going to take a while before all of them die away. Um, the programmed, the, um, the length of time in ALS depends on the gene, on the person. Um, but what you're seeing is alternating rigidity and weakness. That's because there's alternating firing going on and atrophy, um, muscle twitches, lack of coordination. And then eventually, as more and more nerve cells die off, the muscle gets weaker and weaker and weaker. Um, worsening cues are when the motor nerves controlling our breathing and our swallowing um, become problems. Once we can't breathe and swallow, we can end up with respiratory failure. Um, you can end up with aspiration. Um, and then with ALS, eventually all of our, um, all of our muscles will atrophy leading to paralysis. So there is nothing we can do to stop it. Um, there are a couple of things. Um, those three meds there, um, are, will slow progression, but it does not stop the, um, does not stop the disease at all. Um, eventually they will need respiratory support, um, and we'll just try to prolong that time until you are mechanically ventilated, because once you're mechanically ventilated, you're much more at risk for, um, aspiration and pneumonias. Um, so they will do things like cough assist, breath stacking. Um, we talk a little bit more about that in block four when we talk about spinal cord patients. Um, but basically things to get you to be able to cough with very little muscle strength. Um, having you kind of 
lay on your side and um, percussion, drainage, clearing secretions, um, but eventually will need invasive respiratory support. In the meantime, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy to try and keep as much um, of a quality of life as possible. Um, and that basically, if you can adhere to the medicines, maintain health and reduce complications um, and take good care of yourself, you might be able to extend the time before ALS um, breaks down all of your um, motor nerves and you become paralyzed. But um, it is a no-cure disease. And um, like I said, the three meds up there um, only slow the progression of the disease. So kind of like uh, multiple sclerosis, um, there's no real cure, but we can stop the immune attacks. And if we can decrease exacerbation, we decrease that scarring. Here, ALS, this is physically cell death, and um, we can s slow it down, but we can't stop the process once the gene has been activated and sending out those signals for cell death. Um, We'll end it on a good note with these. So we kind of had multiple sclerosis, autoimmune, um, ALS, genetic. Um, Guillain-Barre is an autoimmune um, process, but it is temporary. The big thing about Guillain-Barre is it is temporary. Yay! Temporary. Um, so that is the best part about Guillain-Barre. Um, it is happens after a respiratory or GI viral infection. So there is something about this virus that the immune system sees. And I don't know if there is something about the virus that looks just like our, um, our uh, nerve myelin. Something about the virus must be just similar enough to some people's myelin receptors or something that the immune system then acutely, rapidly, demyelinates your peripheral nerves. So what happens is one to four weeks after the GI infection, I think the immune system just gets kind of ramped up and um, goes after anything that looks like that virus that it had just attacked. And unfortunately, in some people, um, your myelin looks just like that virus. And then the immune system goes and it's like, you're not supposed to be here. Let's get rid of it. So um, Guillain-Barre is noticeably after a respiratory or GI infection. In fact, this is um, what some people call the flu vaccine um, paralysis. So people that have paralysis after the flu vaccine think it is a vaccine um, complication. It is not. If you had gotten the flu, you would have gotten Guillain-Barre. Um, it's whatever, um, whatever virus was lie was in that vaccine looks just like your myelin and so that when we send out you know when we create antibodies which is what the flu vaccine is supposed to do it exposes you to a little bit of the flu and then you um, make antibodies to it but for something about one of these viruses it just not everybody is going to do it but if your immune system thinks your myelin looks enough like that virus, it will attack the myelin. So what would people will say, oh, I'm, you know, I heard someone got paralyzed after a flu vaccine, so it must be the flu vaccine is bad. Um, they would have gotten Guillain-Barre with that, with that exposure to that certain flu virus. Um, it was going to happen anyway. So if you'd gotten exposed to that flu, you would have ended up with Guillain-Barre afterwards. Um, it just happened to be in that vaccine. So a couple of people have said this is a vaccine reaction, which it's really not. It's just a autoimmune super, um, super attack. <clears throat> and it's because the myelin looks just like the viral infection. So what's going to happen is it starts out <clears throat> with tingling and numbness of the extremities, and then it is characteristically ascending muscle weakness and paralysis. Why is it ascending, beginning in the legs and then progressing upwards? I don't know. <coughs> I wish I did. But it is ascending. So all of a sudden, um, the feet will be numb and tingling, and then you will lose sensation in your feet, and then you lose function, and it starts working its way up. Um, it also causes orthostatic hypotension. The worsening cues is, you can kind of see it coming, if it's ascending paralysis, 
it can paralyze all the way up um, through the intercostals and the diaphragm muscles, taking away um, your breathing muscles, requiring mechanical ventilation, can paralyze um, the facial muscles, causing problems talking, talking chewing, swallowing. Um, so we're going to be keeping an eye on the decreased sensation and um, how fast it is ascending. And just temporary. Um, it is temporary. It will go away, but does not cause lifetime paralysis. We make myelin. So good news, folks. We make myelin. Those glial cells will be working double time and remaking myelin and recoding the nerves and the nerve conduction will begin again. Um, but the problem is that in the meantime, we don't want to have to go on ventilator support or have trouble aspirating or having other complications. So um, what they'll do when Gillian barre is diagnosed is try plasmapheresis, which we remember from our thrombocytopenia lecture. They'll try plasmapheresis or um, immunoglobin therapy, which will basically try to get the antibodies out or to stop attacking the myelin. So um, they will try plasmapheresis, IVIG. Hopefully those work to remove the and or disable the attacking antibodies. Um, if it does not work, then um, they may need respiratory support um, for mechanical ventilation. So, um, but try to keep the, pa you know, the patient, especially if the muscles are starting to get weak, um, try to prolong the time until mechanical ventilation is needed. Um, but definitely let the patient know that even if it gets to the point that plasmapheresis or IVIG does not work and the paralysis ascends up to your respiratory tract, that mechanical ventilation will be temporary. Um, the syndrome is temporary, does not cause lifetime paralysis. Um, just make sure that they stay hydrated and calories to ensure the regeneration of myelin. But those little glial cells have to recoat every nerve from toes to to um, toes to face. And when it goes away, um, it goes away from head to toes. So it starts from toes and works its way up to the head. As it goes away, it repairs itself from head to toes. So you'll get your, um, your respiratory muscles back before you get your leg muscles back. Um, so Guillain-Barre, temporary. So all of this is involved in um, Guillain-Barre and multiple sclerosis are involved in the myelin sheath. Um, multiple sclerosis is a permanent lifetime autoimmune um, disease that will constantly attack myelin throughout its lifetime, and the goal is to decrease exacerbations and control symptoms. Gillian barre is a one-time attack on the myelin, and once myelin is regenerated, everything is okay again. And then ALS is actual cell death of the neuron and um, leads to muscle atrophy. So those are our nerve degeneration disorders. Um, I suggest you go take a break until we until and then t put me on pause for a little bit. That was a lot to digest. Um, go digest that and then come back for myasthenia gravis. I gave you a minute. Did you walk away? I hope you walked away and took a break because that was a lot. Um, we're going to talk about myasthenia gravis next. So we talked about multiple sclerosis. Um, sclerosis, I like to think of as scarring, um, and I like to remember that one is the scarring one. Myasthenia gravis, I like to think as the grave one. This one is worse and has graver consequences. Multiple sclerosis can cause um, bowel bladder dysfunction. It can cause paralysis, um, but usually of the extremities, it causes vision disabilities, but nothing that's going to... Um, be ABC wise a problem, whereas myasthenia gravis is much graver and does affect the respiratory muscles. So here's our myasthenia gravis. This is another autoimmune disease, but this one is attacking acetylcholine receptors. Oh, I had a beautiful picture of those. Where are they? Oh, I got rid of my beautiful picture. We're going back to this picture. I have it in the neuromuscular junction. I thought I'd 
put it in there too. I loved this picture. This one right here at the bottom is a beautiful picture of your acetylcholine receptor. So this is the neuromuscular junction. This is your acetylcholine, is a little neurotransmitter, and all the muscles have these acetylcholine receptors. And acetylcholine goes into there and it creates a contraction. Yay, you need to receive acetylcholine to make a muscle contraction. So this is a damage to the acetylcholine receptors. So for some reason, the immune system decides it's going to take out. Maybe it looks just like another bug. I don't know. But they're going to take out these acetylcholine receptors. So we are left with men, fewer, fewer, fewer acetylcholine receptors. So I wanted to show you that picture. Um, I think I have another picture of it in here somewhere, but I really liked that one. Um, so think about that little neuromuscular junction right here. That's where the, the autoimmune system or where the immune system, it's attacking the acetylcholine receptors on your skeletal muscles. So acetylcholine has nowhere to land and your muscles don't get the signal to do what they're supposed to do. Um, acetylcholine, so that's its, those are its two jobs. I'm going to put this up here because this will come into play in just a minute. Acetylcholine has two jobs. One is to transmit nerve impulses to the skeletal muscles, which it does beautifully. The other job acetylcholine has is to transmit parasympathetic rest and digest impulses. So when there is a lot of acetylcholine, um, it stimulates the parasympathetic system. So that means it's going to do cholinergic things. So a lot of acetylcholine will get your bowels rolling, um, get your bladder emptying, uh, slow down your heart rate, um, do a, a cholinergic things. So that's what acetylcholine and cholinergic go together. Um, Acetylcholine then is broken down in that neuromuscular junction so that we can open up those receptors for another impulse. Um, acetylcholine is broken down by acetylcholine esterase. So acetylcholine, the esterase, esterase means to break down. Um, so acetylcholine esterase is what is responsible for eating up the acetylcholine, taking it out of the receptor and clearing it up for later. So um, let me just redraw. I'm going to redraw the little picture here if I can. So here's our, um, our muscle. And we have our little acetylcholine receptors. And um, we should have a ton of them. And what they do is acetylcholine will go in here and it gets released from the nerve cell and it binds to the receptors. The muscle contracts and then acetylcholinesterase will come in here. Uh, let's see, what color can I make acetylcholinesterase? Acetylcholinesterase will come in here, dissolve the acetylcholine, and then these receptors are free for another acetylcholine transmission. So acetylcholine jumps in, fills up the receptors, the muscle contracts, and then acetylcholinesterase comes in, eats up that acetylcholine, which then frees up the receptors for another stimulation. So that's how it's supposed to work. What happens in myasthenia gravis when we do not have enough receptors? So let's say that we have killed off these three and we only have one receptor. Well, now, when, um, when we send a signal out, um, there may be another one, but it's not getting anywhere. So we get weaker muscle contractions. So we get weakness of skeletal muscles because the acetylcholine getting released from the nerve doesn't have a receptor. So, um, and then acetylcholine will come in and eat them all up and make them recycled. Um, so basically we have weakness because we can't get those receptors activated so the muscle contracts weakly. The muscles that are most commonly affected are the eyes and eyelids, chewing, swallowing, speaking, and your diaphragm. So all the important ones that we said we don't wanna lose our breathing or our chewing or swallowing muscles because then we aspirate and we have trouble with our respiratory. And guess what myasthenia gravis does? It's grave, it starts affecting our respiratory status. Um, 
you can see this beautiful little lady on the picture here um, is in a myasthenic episode with muscle weakness and then without. This is the same person. Looks completely different. Um, muscles are strongest in the morning and become exhausted with continued activity. Um, that's because the more times it's asked to do something, it can't generate a contraction because we don't have receptors to receive acetylcholine. Um, periods of rest can restore muscle strength, um, but then as soon as you do an activity, they get weak again. Um, there is no sensory loss. Everything's fine with your reflexes. It's just weak muscles, and unfortunately, the muscles of the eyes, eyelids, chewing, swallowing, speaking, and breathing. So how do you know if you have acetylchol or this um, myasthenia gravis? What they're going to do, and this is why I told you about the cholinergic thing, is they're going to give you a cholinergic stimulating medication, so something that's going to stimulate acetylcholine. Um, if you get more acetylcholine hanging out, so let's draw our little, um, our little muscle thing again. Let's say we have myasthenia gravis and I'm going to draw my muscle with its one receptor because all the other ones are dead. All the other ones got eaten up. So we have one receptor and we have our, um, neuron here that is now ejecting acetylcholine. So remember, we had um, we have this little bugger over here called acetylcholinesterase waiting to kill off acetylcholine as soon as it arrives because its job is to really eat up acetylcholine so that you don't continually have a muscle contraction. So um, acetylcholine comes out, binds to this receptor. Well, the acetylcholinesterase will go in there and eat it up. But now all the acetylcholinesterase is eating up all this thing. So we have to overstimulate. So when the acetylcholinesterase eats up all the acetylcholine, there's nothing left in the junction to stimulate that new muscle receptor. So everything's been cleared out, and the acetylcholinesterase is still hanging out, but there's no acetylcholine because it ate it all up. So we've got this acetylcholinesterase waiting around until our next transmission. So what we're going to do is we're going to give a cholinergic stimulating medication, which is going to send a ton of acetylcholine, a ton. And it's basically going to override the acetylcholinesterase, and that will allow the muscle to keep contracting because as fast as the acetylcholinesterase goes and knocks out um, acetylcholine, there's still acetylcholine available to bind to the receptor site. So basically, we just overstimulate the junction with acetylcholine, and that makes your symptoms get better because it didn't get all eaten up in the meantime. So what we do is we wear out the client by using up all their acetylcholine. We make them constrict a muscle to the point that it has no more acetylcholine left. The acetylcholine esterase ate it all. We throw a ton of acetylcholine into the whole system, and muscle contraction happens again. So it's how they diagnose it. It's called a Tensilon test, and they give this medicine, Tensilon, um, which stimulates and gives you more acetylcholine, and that makes your muscles better. So this would be the treatment for myasthenia gravis, Tensilon would, except for the fact that it only lasts 15 minutes. So if it's lasting 15 minutes, um, it's not going to do you much good for the long term. You'd have to be taking a med every 15 minutes um, for it to work. So Tensilon is just used to diagnose myasthenia gravis, and it does this by throwing so much acetylcholine in there that the acetylcholinesterase can't eat it all up, and that acetylcholine then can continue to create movement. Um, so if you have myasthenia gravis, Tensilon will make your muscles contract and everything will be great. Um, so that's how we diagnose myasthenia gravis. Um, that's called a positive uh, Tensilon test. That means you have myasthenia gravis and everything got better when we gave Tensilon. Um, a negative Tensilon test means, ooh, you didn't have myasthenia gravis. What do you think is going to happen if we give a ton of acetylcholine and we didn't need it? It's going to cause, um, and what you're going to have to remember for your test, a cholinergic crisis versus a myasthenic crisis.
So let's just stop for a minute from that and go and look at myasthenia crisis. Myasthenic crisis is an acute respiratory muscle weakness due to a lack of acetylcholine. The acetylcholine esterase ate it all up. There wasn't enough to stimulate a muscle movement um, and or you're lacking. You just can't get that muscle to contract because the acetylcholine um, got eaten up by the acetylcholine esterase and it's not available any longer to create a muscle movement. So severely weakened. So myasthenic crisis is the worsening cue of myasthenia gravis. It means you're having muscle um, respiratory distress, respiratory failure, weak cough, impaired swallowing, and overall muscle weakness. Um, increased blood pressure and heart rate. Why do you have increased blood pressure and heart rate? Because you have a lack of acetylcholine. If you are lacking acetylcholine, acetylcholine is cholinergic, and it drops your heart rate and it lowers your blood pressure because everything rest, digest. It causes some vasodilation, it causes a slow heart rate, it causes increased um, bowel movement or increased bowel and bladder contraction. It's the opposite of the parasympathetic system. I mean, it's the opposite of the sympathetic system. The system, sympathetic system is rest, uh, is flight, flight. So sympathetic system will make your pupils dilate. Um, yes. Pupils, oh, I did that wrong. This is pupil constriction. Wait, I'm confusing myself. That's right. I had it right on the side. Okay. So acetylcholine is cholinergic. These are the things acetylcholine does. Drops your heart rate. Increase, drops your blood pressure. Increases your bowel and bladder. Um, it causes pupil constriction. So if you are blocking or you're lacking acetylcholine, you're going to get the opposite effects. You're going to have increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, pupil dilation. So um, cholinergic is going to be rest digest on steroids, and anticholinergic is going to be super stimulated. So when we are lacking acetylcholine, we are actually looking somewhat stimulated um, blood pressure, heart rate wise. We are looking sympathetic. They are weak muscles, weak respirations because acetylcholine is used in the skeletal muscles, um, but it will cause an increased blood pressure and heart rate and pupil dilation because it is the opposite of cholinergic. And it's a lack of our acetylcholine, a lack of our cholinergic stimulation. So you get a what looks like the flight fight. Increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, pupil dilation. Now, you should have increased respirations with that, but we're too weak to have increased respirations. Uh, myasthenic crisis is triggered by infection, surgery, distress, stress, um, or not taking adequate myasthenia gravis medication. So if you don't take your meds, you end up in myasthenic crisis. Um, we were actually in clinical at St. Joe's, and we had a... Um, a woman with myasthenia gravis who got pregnant. Well, pregnant is a giant emotional distress and stress on the body. And basically the whole time she was pregnant, she was on a ventilator because every single time she tried to do anything, um, basically there was nothing they could give her that would get her muscles strong enough because the stress of the body kept sending her into myasthenic crisis. Um, she was I think on the ventilator for six or seven months until the baby came enough to term and once they delivered the baby she started getting better. So um, the stress of pregnancy sent her into basically a long-term myasthenic crisis. Um, so what do you do when someone has myasthenia gravis, um, has this muscle weakness, periods of rest are not enough to keep you going. You end up in myasthenic crisis, which is acute respiratory muscle weakness.
what do we do? There is a wonderful med that is called Mestinon, and that is our treatment for myasthenia gravis. And what it does is it blocks that wonderful little muncher of acetylcholine. It blocks um, it blocks colon ester. Oh, did I call the whole thing anticholinesterase? Oh, Lord have mercy. I called it the name of the drug. Cholinesterase. Did I, where did I write that? Let me go back. I think I messed up something. Lack of acetylcholine. Let me go back. Acetylcholine is broken down in the neuromuscular junction. Oh, yes, by acetylcholinesterase. Okay, not anticholinesterase. I thought I had written anticholinesterase, acetylcholinesterase. Okay, I did it right. Whew. All right, I told you to go take a break. I hope you took a break. So this is an actually, um, technically this would be an anti-acetylcholinesterase medication. What this is doing is this is blocking the, this is, acetylcholinesterase. It's blocking the guy that eats up acetylcholine, and that increases acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction, allowing more contractions to happen before it gets broken down. So the problem that we had with that, um, with the myasthenia gravis muscle, remember, is that we only have one receptor, and it can only be filled or let's say we only have two, it can only be filled just so much. Um, so when those acetylcholines are in there, we still need the anticholinesterase to take it out of the receptor site and allow another um, acetylcholine to descend into it. But we want to have more acetylcholine than acetylcholinesterase. We want these little chompers to be diminished or to be blocked. And that will leave more acetylcholine in there and just leave just enough of those little guys to clear out the receptor sites. But we want acetylcholine to be able to settle back into those receptor sites and keep the muscle contracting if we need to. So mestinon is going to block those little, um, those little chompers, I like to call them. Um, so that's our key treatment for myasthenia gravis is an anticholinesterase medication. Um, we're not going to bother doing an autoimmune thing. The receptors, once they're gone, they're gone. We can't get them back. It's not like it's going to be continuously attacking the receptors. The receptors are gone. Um, so our goal is to keep acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction so it can continue to make a contraction. Um, Mestinon is that guy. It will do it for us. Um, and so that's what we need to know about myasthenia gravis is take your mestinon. Um, that will increase the amount of acetylcholine. You still will get fatigued from doing a lot of repetitive activities, but you have better stamina now. The acetylcholine is not getting eaten up as soon as it gets sent out there. Um, you can also get, um, they can do thymectomies. Remember, we had thymectomies for um, any immune disorder. Um, we can get rid of those antibodies that are killing off the acetylcholine receptors. Um, so you can get an improvement. And if you don't lose receptors, if you get a thymectomy early enough and um, you can get rid of those antibodies, then it will preserve some of your acetylcholine receptors. Um, but in the meantime, acetylcholinesterase will keep acetylcholine available to your body, which is all we really need to do with myasthenia gravis is keep that acetylcholine level up. Um, so if you're in myasthenic crisis, um, you may, they may try to do increased doses of mestinon. Um, they'll try to do um, cholinergic medications that will stimulate um, acetylcholine because that is what is causing muscle contractions. Um, but in a myasthenic crisis, um, we are having failing respiratory muscles, so we may need to um, knock down 
that immune suppression. We need, may need to knock down those antibodies that are trying to kill off the remaining receptors that we have. Uh, plasmapheresis or immunosuppressants are appropriate for a myasthenic crisis. Um, I do believe our little pregnant lady um, was getting the highest doses of mestinon that she could get plus plasmapheresis, and she was still in respiratory failure. Um, the stress on the body was just too much. Um, so myasthenia gravis, a lack of acetylcholine um, at the receptor sites, a lack of receptors, a lack of acetylcholine. Our goal is to keep acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junctions. We're going to do that with mestinon. And if we end up in myasthenic crisis with a respiratory failure, um, they can do plasmapheresis or immunosuppressants. Um, but mestinon is our drug of choice for myasthenia gravis. Um, so that's what we're going to tell the patient. Um, take your mestinon and frequent rest periods. Um, easily chewed, swallowed, repetitive motions do wear out your muscles and use up your acetylcholine. So if you want to take your, um, you want to do strenuous activities in the morning when your strength is the greatest. Um, I do believe I wrote somewhere that they're supposed to take their mestinon right before meals. I thought I wrote that somewhere. I'm going to add that in there. So mestinon, um, I don't know if you can see the green. Mestinon, um, take about an hour before meals because we know repetitive um, chewing and swallowing is going to be hard. We certainly don't want our patient to wear out and aspirate any of their food. So we generally dose mestinon about an hour before meals so that it reaches its peak, meaning they have a lot more acetylcholine in their neuromuscular junctions right before needing to do something strenuous like chewing. Um, so I thought I put that somewhere in there. Sorry about that. Um, so take your mestinon um, so that it peaks during meal times. You want it to have peak effect during meals to help you chew and swallow better. Um, so peak effect during meals for mestinon. Um, balanced diet with foods easily chewed and swallow will not take as much energy. Um, avoiding infections and stress, a lot of rest, cough, deep breathing, um, cluster your activities, frequent rest periods are very important. Um, and what they're going to need to know is signs of myasthenic crisis, which we had on the previous page, respiratory failure, trouble swallowing, risk of aspiration. Um, and cholinergic crisis because myasthenic crisis is too little mestinon, not treating myasthenia gravis enough and they become too weak. Too much mestinon is an overdose of your anticholinesterase um, and that will stimulate your parasympathetic system, which means you have bradycardia. Oh, I wrote them all here, bradycardia, decreased blood pressure, um, increased saliva, increased lacrimation, like basically all the things you need to kind of repair your body, get things going. Um, so you'll have increased salivation, increased eye tearing, cramps, because guess what the colon's going to do? It's going to be all amped up. So you're going to actually have increased colon movement, giving you cramps. Um, you can have muscle twitches, diarrhea, urination, because you've got the stimulation of your bowel system going on and pinpoint pupils because that is what the parasympathetic is the opposite of sympathetic flight fight you need heart rate you need blood pressure you need your eyes dilated so you can see better you need your bronchioles dilated so that you can breathe better um, cholinergic is going to be the opposite of that so um, I did put a little summary thing here for you myasthenic crisis would be um, I would say, let's say this is um, under dose of medication or new diagnosis or increased stress. 
So if you increase your stress and um, or your stress or your activity, and you're not taking enough medication to um, stimulate that, then you can send yourself into a myasthenic crisis. So underdose of the medication, um, the first diagnosis of myasthenic of myasthenia gravis is going to be a myasthenic crisis, just like the new diagnosis of diabetes type 1 is usually DKA. You have to go into the worst case scenario for them to be like, oh, look what happened. Um, so myasthenic crisis is usually um, seen with a new diagnosis or when the body goes under stress that the medication dose is not accurate. Um, cholinergic crisis is an overdose of your medications. Mestinon. Uh, and it's going to cause an overstimulation. It's going to cause too much acetylcholine, and that is going to cause a cholinergic crisis. This is a lack of acetylcholine. Okay? Makes tons and tons of sense. I think myasthenia gravis is graver because it affects your heart, your uh, respiratory system, but it's also hard because you got this myasthenic crisis, cholinergic crisis thing going on. So I hope I explained it to the best of my ability there. Um, and that is um, myasthenia gravis, which is your neuromuscular junction disorder. Whew, take another break. We have two more and then we're done. Did you take a break? I warned you last time. You didn't listen. And you just blew through, and now you're brain fried. So hopefully you took a break, and we're just going to do Parkinson's and Huntington's disease, which are degenerative, meaning not growth, breakdown, um, breakdown of your brain neurons. Oh, no. So um, really, we're not looking at the whole brain. Do not memorize this. We're dealing with uh, these two disorders affect the basal ganglia. And so we're having trouble with memory, emotion, and coordination of muscle movement with both of these um, disorders. So you don't need to worry about the rest of it. Don't worry, you'll see it again in block four when we come back to neuro. But for this time around, we're just talking about the basal ganglia. Parkinson's disease is the degeneration or programmed cell death of dopamine-producing neurons. So remember, dopamine's a neurotransmitter. It's one of our primary. Dopamine and serotonin are our two um, transmitters in the brain. There's um, no coincidence that dopamine and serotonin are our feel-good um, hormones because they actually allow um, nerve transmission around the brain. And you feel great when you're having good, smooth nerve transmission around. Um, dopamine and serotonin are our primary brain neurotransmitters. And Parkinson's disease degenerates dopamine in the basal ganglia. Here's a brain uh, normal, and there's a nicely firing dopamine basal ganglia in the top corner. So we're looking right here at our top picture. This is our normal brain. And this is your brain on Parkinson's. You can see there's hardly any activity in the basal ganglia there. And that is because the dopamine producing neurons are gone. Um, the cues of dopamine producing neurons are going to be basically death of the functions of the basal ganglia. So memory, emotion, and coordination of muscle movements. So we're just going to write that here. Memory. What did I, oh, dang it. I forgot it. I can't even remember. List. Memory, emotion, coordination of muscle movement. The big one is coordination of muscle movement, which we see our triad of um, Parkinson's disease. This is our triad right here, is we have tremor at rest, rigidity, and bradykinesia. So they will end up with a pill rolling thumb and forefinger. Roll your thumb and forefinger together right now, I know you're doing it, roll your thumb and forefinger together in a circle, and that is the tremor. Um, the tremor gets worse with um, emotional stress or concentration. It is a rest tremor when they go to do something, um, that the tremor goes away because um, they're spending all of their dopamine on trying to get a movement going. Um, rigidity, um, the 
the brain cannot send out a clear signal to the body to um, to contract properly. And what it's doing is it sends out um, just contraction and you end up with sustained muscle contraction, stooped posture. Cogwheel rigidity means a jerky motion to your movements. Um, but basically we have sustained muscle contractions and contractures and your body is constantly just holding your, um, holding your muscles in a contracted form. It makes you exhausted, fatigue, chronic pain. Um, and then when you go to make a complex movement, complex movements would be swallowing, talking, um, walking, um, anything complex, like even pointing your finger and moving it around, all these movements that we take for granted, um, especially people who are nice hand talkers like I am, you're not watching me right now, but I'm hand talking away. Um, all those movements become slowed or missing because the basal ganglia cannot coordinate the movements properly without dopamine. Um, so tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia, meaning a slowing down of um, voluntary movements. So those are our hallmark of Parkinson's disease. And then, of course, because memory and emotion are dealt in the basal ganglia, we have short-term memory loss, depression, anxiety, insomnia. Um, so what happens as things get worse and we lose more and more dopamine? Um, you can actually have loss or impairment of the voluntary muscle movements, increase in involuntary movements, tremors and tics. Um, you can have constipation, urinary retention, and trouble swallowing dysphagia. Um, orthostatic hypotension because um, vessel vasoconstriction and vasodilation are controlled also by the basal ganglia. So as things get worse, you lose your ability to do complex muscle movements, um, increase in tremors and tics, and um, you're starting to have trouble swallowing, meaning you drool and you have a risk of aspiration with anything you eat. And then as the um, memory and uh, emotions start to subside, um, you end up with dementia. Um, so, sad, terrible. Um, mental status, we're going to be watching for onset of um, worsening dementia. We're going to be watching muscle strength and gait to see if we are declining in our ability to do voluntary muscle movements. Um, watching that rigidity and pain, um, again, those involuntary movements and the rigidity get worse um, as time goes on. And um, if you have any dysphagia for any reason, and this would go with... Um, I should put this in um, uh, myasthenic crisis as well. Whenever you're having trouble swallowing, um, if you are drooling, that means you don't have a good swallow. You're not even handling your own oral secretions. So a patient that is drooling probably does not have an adequate swallow. And if you are drooling um, and don't have an adequate swallow, please watch for risk of aspiration pneumonia. Um, you can even aspirate on your own oral secretions. Um, and that just means that something is getting down into your airway causing aspiration pneumonia. So um, anytime somebody is drooling, um, be aware of the fact that they probably do not have control over their um, swallow reflexes as well. Um, the four standard medications for Parkinson's disease are involved in getting your dopamine levels up. The cells that create dopamine are dying off. Um, so the first med is we're going to do something that mimics dopamine. Um, there's also MAOB inhibitors, so you don't need to know the different meds, but know dopamine agonists, MAOB inhibitors, levodopa, and COMPT inhibitors. Those are the four medications for Parkinson's disease. Um, again, dopamine agonists and um, MAOB inhibitors are usually our first-line drugs. And then levodopa is the best drug. It's actually the precursor to dopamine, and we can deliver that to the brain. And then you get dopamine, but unfortunately, its effectiveness wears off after a few years, or it would be the only treatment. Um, but because its effectiveness wears off for a few years, they usually save levodopa to when you're in your peak um, symptoms, and then they can throw levodopa at it for a while. Um, it's usually a combination drug, levodopa with carbidopa, and carbidopa is its little protector, its little um, body, its little side armor guy. Um, carbidopa keeps 
dope, levodopa from breaking down in the bloodstream until it can cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's kind of like the, um, the chaperone for it. It's keeping levodopa safe until it can cross the bloodstream, I and mean, maybe before it can cross the blood-brain barrier. So le- carbidopa um, keeps levodopa safe until it gets to the brain. Um, and then there's the the COMPT, I am not even going to say, because I can, I'm not even going to say it. The COMPT inhibitor um, blocks the breakdown um, of dopamine. So whatever dopamine we do have in our brain, we want to preserve. So it's kind of like the acetylcholinesterase guy. We don't want it eating acetylcholine, so we give mestinon. So here the COMPT inhibitors will allow us to keep whatever dopamine we do make and whatever converts from levodopa we're going to keep that stuff safe because we need the dopamine. Um, Our dopamine generating cells are gone. The other things we can do is deep brain stimulation. Um, This would be electrodes that they actually put into the basal ganglia and um, can stimulate or basically kind of like pacemaking. It stimulates the the basal ganglia and um, basically calms down the tremors and the tics and um, increases your coordination a little bit. Um, And so deep brain stimulation is a great adjunct therapy. Um, It is an invasive procedure, so it would be um, discussed with the physician. Um, And patients are usually able to decrease their Parkinson's meds after deep brain stimulus. So it is a great adjunct therapy that most patients with Parkinson do look into, as long as there's no risk factors of, um, you know, putting something into your brain. Um, but it's basically putting an electrode down into the uh, basal ganglia to stimulate those, um, the basal ganglia to function a little better. Um, then there's all the symptom relief drugs. Because we have constipation, urinary retention, we'll do anticholinergics, which are going to slow down bowels and um, uh, anticholinergics. Yes, should... Hmm. I'm going to have to look and see if that's correct. Because cholinergics would stimulate bowel movement. Anticholinergics would slow down bowel movements. I think I've talked myself into a circle here. I'll look at that. I know you use anticholinergics. Now I'm going to have to, I'll have to, um, I'll have to think on that one. Okay, I pause it for a minute and get a little bit of research. This is actually wrong. That should not be there. Anticholinergics would not be good. Anticholinergics would make your constipation worse. All of this is goes with anticholinesterases. So we will um, give an anticholinesterase which acts as a um, a cholinergic um, stimulation. We're going to increase acetylcholine, and that is going to relieve constipation and block overstimulation of muscle activity. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna just get rid of those. Anticholinesterases. <laughs> um, we can also use antidepressants, antipsychotics to relieve the mood disorders and the dementia uh, slightly. Um, and then amatidine um, will relieve dyskinesias, the voluntary spontaneous movements. So that's what we're, I, I got this all mixed up you know I don't know how I got it mixed up it's not like they all sound the same Um, we want cholinergic stimulation to relieve constipation and urinary retention we want to keep um, bowel bladders moving Um, anticholinesterases will do that Um, antidepressants antipsychotics and will control the tics and the dyskinesias with um, mantidine Um, and here is your summary of the meds right here Um, so those are our um, and that's where I was getting, I don't even know. I went to the next screen and I'm like, oh, for goodness sakes, I had it all right here in the, in the slide. Um, so anti, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors will act as a, in, as a stimulant for the cholinergic increase. Our acetylcholine will help with our, um, our, 
our bowel and bladder issues, keep things moving along. So the MAOB inhibitors, levodopa, dopamine agonist, and Compton inhibitors are our four treatments for um, these right here, are our big four for Parkinson's disease. Um, amanodine is for ticks and um, involuntary muscle movements and tremors. Um, and then the pump delivery levodopa. Wow, that's cool. Um, so those will, that's a different way to deliver. These are our big four, and then amantadine is for the, tr the rigidity and the tics that are going on. And then we have our antidepressants and antipsychotics for mood and um, memory. And this will keep neurotransmitters are around. They're serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, and they just basically keep more um, neurotransmitters around so that we can get those... Um, we don't have dopamine, but we do want to keep other neurotransmitters around for um, ability to have good moods and memories. And then cholinesterase inhibitors are for um, urinary and bowel symptoms. And those will um, relieve constipation and relieve urinary retention. So those are the meds. Um, make sure that they're seeing a provider to give medication adjustments as the symptoms progress. Um, you can see there were quite a few meds and therapies available. Um, compliance, there's a lot of physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, and learning how to deal with the bradykinesias, um, home health for fall safety at home, um, time, time, time. It's You're never going to be able to speed up someone with Parkinson's. They have bradykinesia. They have slow movement. They will not speed up for you. So just provide ample time for activities. Eating is going to be an hour-long process. Um, getting out to the car, going to a doctor's appointment, double, triple, quadruple the time. If anyone is taking care of any family members with Parkinson's, um, you will know this. Double, triple, quadruple the time because there's just not going to move faster. Um, muscle rigidity is a great form of pain, so warm bath relaxation. Um, you can get rocking movements to get a repetitive motion going, which actually helps institute complex movements better. So if you want to get someone to walk, it might be good to rock back and forth before going to walk. To walk. Um, just lots of little things. And definitely because we have trouble swallowing, that's a complex movement. Food should be tiny, bite-sized, soft, um, easy to chew. Um, small, frequent meals to prevent fatigue, thickened liquids. Um, nutrition is really, really important and adequate hydration. But adequate hydration on someone that has aspiration issues and can't drink thin liquids. Um, do I have thickened liquids on here? This should say um, food should be bite-sized, soft, or thickened liquids. Um, they make a uh, supplement that you can put into water or lemonade or something that will thicken it so you get all the taste of the, um, of the liquid, but it's thickened so it goes, it gets swallowed a lot easier. Um, so that is Parkinson's disease. <coughs> Excuse me. Our last disease is Huntington's. And this one, um, Parkinson's was, um, did have a genetic, um, component to it, but it also had environmental. I don't think I wrote that on there, the causes of Parkinson's. They're not 100% sure of the causes of Parkinson's, um, but they do believe that there is uh, along the lines of environmental factors that cause gene expression, kind of like with ALS. Um, Huntington's disease is also a genetic degenerative brain disorder. Um, this causes premature death of just not the dopamine producing cells, but all the cells in the basal ganglia. So memory, emotion and coordinated movements are going to be a big problem in Huntington's disease. Um, first signs and symptoms of Huntington's disease is um, cognitive. Um, it is almost psych difficulty organizing, processing, focusing, slowness, finding words, again very subtle symptoms. Um, difficulty learning um, and psychiatric systems. Depression, obsessive compulsive, bipolar. So the first symptoms are going to be 
psych patient symptoms. ADHD, um, psych, they're going to be going through a lot of um, probably psychotherapy, a lot of evaluations for psych problems, um, a lot of um, problems with learning disabilities. Again, this starts to develop between ages 30 to 50, and then physical symptoms set in after the early stages. Um, unsteady gait and starting to have tics. Huntington's disease is well known um, for chorea. Chorea is a certain kind of involuntary tick. So Huntington's disease, um, as it progresses, which it will, there's nothing we can do to stop it. Again, programmed cell death of the basal ganglia. Um, abnormal voluntary movements, and they are twisting movements, writhing and twisting movements um, that are constantly happening. Um, chorea is the hallmark of Huntington's disease, and by the time they have chorea, um, they are late into Huntington's disease. As the basal ganglia dies away, the chorea worsens into flaccidity, and you end up with muscle wasting and an inability to swallow. Um, so, um, poor Huntington's disease, this is um, basically, it starts out as um, kind of a psych disease with a late onset. Um, most psych disorders, um, kind of, I, if you remember from psych, um, usually have their um, periods where they, um, I forget what it's called, when they get, when they develop, but they're usually teens, early 20s. Here, Huntington's disease is starting in the 30s. Um, so we're starting with learning, you know, not learning disabilities, but just disabilities and processing thought, things that you were able to easily do, you're not able to easily do anymore, mood disorders, um, and then all, then the chorea and the tics. Um, and then eventually, through time, the chorea will disintegrate into paralysis. Um, no cure, unfortunately. Control the psychiatric cognitive disorders. There is a med to control chorea, uh, tetrabenzazine, and they can use um, benzodiazepines or other um, anti-epileptics, anti-convulsant medications to control the movements of a chorea. Um, a child of a parent with Huntington's disease has a 50% chance of inheriting the disorder. Um, so that is a big, big um, genetic issue with Huntington's disease. And unfortunately, since the onset is 30 to 50, people have already settled down and had kids by the time they realize. So this is something very important to find out, um, family history of Huntington's disease. So genetic counseling is appropriate for a patient with Huntington's disease and support. And that is it. I put these at the end because I think this is so much information for you to process that I wanted you to be able to see people with these disorders and hear their stories because rather than memorize a list for multiple sclerosis, go hear what Montel says about multiple sclerosis. You will probably remember and you can tag people with diseases and you'll remember them a lot easier. Um, you know, we ha I tried to find the notable um, Michael J. Fox, Muhammad Ali, definitely um, uh, advocates for Parkinson's disease, but they have stories to tell. And if you can listen to their stories, I think that will help you keep a picture with the disease um, while you're going through and doing your remits. Um, you know, really put these stories on in the background and um, hear their thoughts and hear their stories and um, that way you can um, put a person to these disorders. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, let me know and thank you for listening to this long lecture.